Well, in the introduction, um, <clears throat> you've heard that I've been an educator for 40 years. And when I look back on my 40 years as an educator, as a principal, a teacher, a writer, a consultant, it seems to me that I've spent my whole career trying to make sure that children and students didn't have the type of education that I had. <laughs> and I also think it's probably a lot of you might agree with me. Because if you look at schools, the basic structure and design of schools have not changed too much. If you think about how much change there has been in our society, it's amazing. But what basically hasn't changed? Schools. But yet we look to schools as being sort of the way that change happens. <clears throat> so I've thought a lot about changing schools, but so have a lot of people too. Not only have schools not changed, people for many, many years now have talked about changing schools. So it's not as if People have said, hey, our schools are great. They should stay the way they are. No, people have been talking about changing schools for a long time, and schools have not changed. I think part of the reason is we don't really understand the basic design and structure of schools and why they don't change. <clears throat> and we're also not very clear or in agreement of what they should change to. And you really can't go from point A to point B unless you know where you are in point A and understand where you are and have a vision of where you want to go. That's part of the problem. <clears throat> One of the great influences of me is a philosopher, John Dewey, and he wrote about education over 100 years ago when the basic structure of school as we know it now was in place. He didn't like it too much. He had a different vision. And in this quote I'm going to share with you, I think it makes it very clear about where schools are and have been for 100 years and sort of the problem with that. But also he says this is where we need to go. So he's telling us where point A is, and he's telling us where point B is. And he was a very wise person. He's guided my whole career as an educator. And this was what he said. Education is not preparation for life. Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. So Dewey looked at schools the way they are, pretty much the way I experienced it and the way you've experienced it, and he said what's happening in schools is not education. But isn't that what we call education? What's happening in schools? Dewey said no. Well, then what's been going on in school for 100 years if education hasn't been happening there? We have to ask ourselves that. He said, what's happening in schools is not education. Well, what is it? And if we take what he says, that education is life itself, and we want to know where we want to go, we have to, say to, we have to ask the question, what is life? What is life about? And you know what? Those are hard questions to answer. And we tend to not like to answer hard questions. We want to almost like skip over them and just maybe add a program to a school or pass legislation. But we don't get anywhere because we don't really look at those two questions. We don't really understand point A and point B. Well, I was lucky. I actually had a, a February vacation where I visited an environment that was a point A environment. It reminded me a lot of school. And then the next day I went to visit an environment that was a point B environment, the way I think Dewey envisioned it. And guess where that was? At a baseball training camp. 
See, I love baseball, and every February we would go down to Florida just to watch pitchers and catchers throw the ball around. Not even games. When you're in the cold, dark winter of February, going down to Florida and watching grown men throw a little white ball around is an incredible experience. <laughs> so I went, and I am a Yankee fan, but where we went in Florida was near the Mets training camp. The Yankee training camp is very similar. So I went to the Mets training camp, and guess what I saw? Anchor fences. And I also saw security guards. This is baseball. Well, when the players stopped playing, pitch, uh, playing catch, they'd walk over to the edge of the anchor fence to go sign autographs. Well, there were 100 fans there, and these fans would rush to the fence, not caring about who they may knock over, not caring about who they might trample on. They got to get that autograph. And I'm saying, some of them could get hurt just because these people want to get an autograph. How could they do that? How could they be so senseless and careless and irresponsible? Well, then I had been reading a lot of social psychology. And there's a lot of research, very robust research, not just theory, that people pick up signals from the environment and cues, and they assimilate those into an identity, and then they act on the script that that identity conveys to them. And if you look at it as like a little kid, kids look to us to say, who am I? And how we treat them or talk to them sort of tells them that. Well, the environment does that too. Think about it. If you're in a quiet restaurant and people are talking quietly and there's low lights, you don't start yelling there like you're in McDonald's. But if you're in an environment where people have littered all around, you end up littering. So it hit me that in this baseball camp, on some level, the camp was saying to these people, we can't trust you. You're out of control. We need to have fences and security guards. And you know what? The people assume that identity and probably figured, well, I don't have to control my behavior because the fence will and the guard will. So they took on this identity of people who are out of control. And you know what? They proved that the fences were needed. They proved that the guards were needed. Because if you looked at how they acted and you said, let's take away the fence, let's take away the guards, you'd say, you're crazy. There's a man camp. See the fence? And we see this all the time, right? You go driving down the road, work zone, fines doubled. What message is that saying? You're irresponsible people. Even though you see workers there, you're not going to slow down unless you feel like you're going to lose a lot of money. It sends a message. So, <clears throat> social psychologists, though, have done research. I'll just give you one quick example of how powerful messages are in shaping identity. They did this research where they took five and six year old kids, and to one group of kids, they said, Oh, you're really good helpers. You're really good helpers. You help at school. You're a good helper at home. You're a good helper all, all around. And then the other group, they said, oh, you're good at helping. I bet you help. And then the experimenter dropped the can of pencils. Which group of kids do you think stopped playing with toys and picked up the pencil? The ones who were told they're helpers. Because when you have an identity, you act consistently with that identity. They called up a, a bunch of people and said, are you going to vote on Tuesday? And then they called another group of people and said, being a responsible voter, are you going to vote on Tuesday? Which group do you think voted more on Tuesday? The responsible voter. Because on some level, research has shown 
What do responsible voters do? They vote. Right? If someone says you're a charitable person, you're more likely to give because you know what? Charitable people give. So these subtle messages that we don't even register drive our behavior. <clears throat> now let's take that meds camp and apply it to school. If you spend some time in most schools and look at how they're organized, there's two key assumptions about people that are sort of built in, baked into the design of schools. First one, kids, people need to be controlled first in order to learn. Second, in order to learn, you have to be taught. So those two assumptions, from the minute that kids walk into the school, door of most schools, everything convey that message to them. <clears throat> you ask most kindergarten kids, what's the most important thing in school? And they'll say, follow directions. Is that learning, though? And how do you show that you learn? You pass a test. The learning that someone gives you, that taught you. So, you, do, you experience that day after day, month after month, year after year, 12 years, and boy, that does become your identity. I'm someone who needs to be motivated to learn. I'm someone who has to be controlled in order to control myself. <clears throat> and there's three rules, if you think about it that you need to follow in school in order to be successful. And if you follow these three rules, it's hard to think of how you're not going to be successful. Get good grades on the work that you're given. Follow the rules. Do what you're told. And don't worry too much about the person next to you. All that's important is how you do. And if you're really good at following these rules, get, you earn another identity. You become a winner. And if you're not too good at following those rules, guess what? You start to think of yourself as a loser. And if you went in and even talked to a lot of kids in first grade, they can tell you who the winners are and they can tell you who the losers are. They learn that pretty quick. And if you went to most teachers and said, wouldn't you like every kid to follow all those rules? You'd have no problems. They would say that's the perfect scenario. Not all teachers, but some would. <clears throat> so really, we have, we've unfortunately created an environment where what's most important is to stay inside this little box called school. Don't think outside of it. Only learn what's given to you in it. Don't question anything. Just do what you're told. And I think what Dewey said was, that's defining life for these kids and saying, here's the life you need to live. And it's also telling them who they are. And I don't think Dewey thought you should impose that on people. <clears throat> and if you stop and think about it, that is not education. That is training. All right, it makes a lot more sense. If you get a job, that job is already well defined. And you need to be trained to do that job. And training is not bad, but it's not education. Steve Jobs said, this is from Steve Jobs. He said, when you grow up, you tend to get told the world is the way it is and to live your life inside the world. It's a given, it's fixed. You really can't change it. Just make sure you live inside of it the way you're supposed to. Well, when that happens, guess what? The future only becomes a slight variation of the past. Because the future doesn't change if the people who live in a world don't think they can change it. You just accept it. 
And there's three powerful forces keeping this design in place. Powerful forces. One is fear. Fear. Fear of things getting out of control. I once proposed to a group of high school administrators that not every rule infraction had to be uh, met with a punitive consequence. They didn't even let me finish my sentence. <laughs> they thought I was preaching anarchy. And they pretty much indicated that it would be like the inmates taking over the prison. High school administrators with master's degrees. Second one, the lack of an imagination to envision learning or school as being any other way than the way it is. I once went into a kindergarten classroom, a kindergarten classroom, and I was consulting in this school, and this teacher was superb at controlling her students. These kids did everything she told them to do on cue. They almost followed her around like little ducklings after uh, the mother duck. And I went in on the last, almost the last day of school, and the teacher was in the corner giving kids individual assessments. And I walked in, and she looked at me, and she said, you don't really need to stay here because there's no learning happening. See, she wasn't teaching them. And I walked around, and I saw kids, because it was free play, they did what they want. They were creating imaginary restaurants and asking, came up to me and asked me how to spell the word hot dog. And they created a beauty parlor, and they had a Legos over there where they were creating scenarios. And they were talking. It was the most learning taking place that I had seen. <clears throat> so the, but last but not least, that was very sort of sad to me, was a group of high school students who were on a panel talking about bullying. And after they told these terrible stories, someone said, what do you think you can do about it? And they all said nothing. School is just the way it is. So it's a dead end. How can the future change? if you don't think you can do anything about it. But Dewey had a different vision, and I found it at the Dodger training camp. Because when I walked in, no fences, no security guards, little thin yellow string. I sort of said, respect the players, leave them alone. And it basically said, we trust you, you're responsible, caring people. Figure out the best way to get the autographs. And you know what? Everybody did. The players liked it. The fans were smiling. And you know what? It's not because they were Dodger fans and the Met fans didn't show up. They were the same, a lot of the same people. See, the environment said, the cues said, you're responsible. Figure it out. One day I went running. Remember the fines doubled in work zones? And this is what I saw. <clears throat> Drive like your kids live here. That was giving me a message, giving people a message. You're, you're not irresponsible people who have to worry about losing a lot of money in order to be sensible and caring about kids. This is a little nudge, a reminder that you're a caring person. This will help bring the best out of you. Because the assumption at the Dodger camp and with signs like that is our people are good. People can be trusted. They just need the right environment and opportunity. It's not about confining and liberty, uh, limiting. It's about freeing them. Because Dewey knew what the word education meant. And I did take Latin. <laughs> it means to lead out of. A lot different than training. It means you've got to believe that there's something good in people and it's your job 
to clear a path, to let it come out. And it comes out in different ways in every person. So there's no winners and losers. There's just difference. And that everybody's on the same team. I'll tell you a story where I learned about education at my school. We were, we, I, I felt I knew about it. And I think we were doing a good job. I was trying to move away from training, but I really didn't have the words for it. And this little boy, Kevin, entered in kindergarten. And Kevin was shy. He didn't smile. But you know what? From day one, he realized he wasn't learning as fast as the other kids. And Kevin started to feel like there was something wrong with him. Because all the other kids are learning, and he's not. And when we kept trying to help him, we only kept proving to him that he wasn't as smart or as good as the other kids. And he got quieter and quieter and never caught up. Until one day, a teacher assistant said, Kevin, would you like to work in the school store? Yeah, OK. And Kevin started working in that school store, and he became a whiz. He made change in his head. He rearranged the display. He interacted with the customers. He made the school a better place, and he knew it. He went from being a passive recipient who had to stay within the bounds that we sent because we gave him the Dodger training camp. We gave him an environment where he could discover things. That's what education is. It's a leading out of, it's a freeing up, it's a liberation. For Kevin, it was a hero's quest. If you start reading literature, life should be a hero's quest. It's a never-ending process of learning who you are, learning your purpose. And that there's two hallmarks of education that Kevin was learning because it was education, not training, is agency and community, and they go together. Agency is, I can make a difference. I can solve a problem. I don't have to be wait to be taught. I don't have to wait to be told what to do. I can see a problem. I can solve it. I can make a difference in this world for the common good. And we're all here to help each other do that. This is what Steve Jobs said. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. And once you learn that, you'll never be the same. See, so until you believe that you can change the world, you're not going to do it. And if you're only trained, and if people don't believe that you can be that, you can change the world, you know what? You'll start to believe that you can that the world is fixed and you just have to live in it. So how can we switch from training to education? It's not easy. And most people think pass laws, pass programs, create policies. You know what? I truly believe it can begin with simple relationships. Each time a student or a child sits in front of a teacher. That teacher can start to educate. Three things have to happen. Teachers have to realize they have a choice. They just don't have to keep falling into the same patterns. Then they have to choose that they can educate and not train. And that educate is freeing up helping kids write their own script, write their own life, not just live the life that they're given, and to feel that they can do that. And then the last choice probably is the most important one, to see the hero in every child. Because there is a hero in every child. You have to believe that there's a hero in every child, and that every child can join together and change the world and make it better. Because it's going to take a lot of heroes to change the world. And if they think they can or think they can't, they're right. Henry Ford said that. So I firmly believe 
that if we start educating our kids and we see the hero in them, that a brighter future and a better world is not just possible, but it's inevitable. Thank you.